Okay, why don't we why don't we kick this off? Uh, welcome everybody. I'm really excited to have you here today. Uh, we've got a, uh, a a really interesting group of folks here to talk to you today about um, this crazy world we're in. You know, the only word I can think of is uncertain, right? Nobody knows really what it means. We love when the Fed takes the prices up again, right? Interest rates up again. We don't know what that's going to do, but. I want to introduce you to our our, uh, our panelists here, and then we're going to just kind of have a conversation about some strategies that brokers are looking at of ways to um, you know to kind of shift their focus a little bit, given that the market is shifting, and ways that they're going to continue to to do great, even though um, we're in a different place. So, first, I want to introduce Jonathan Lickstein. He is the um, the founder and broker of Location Real Estate, and we also have Brian Preston here, or BP, as his logo says. Uh, from Rentspree. Uh, so welcome, guys. Thanks to have great to have you here today. Thanks for having me. Thanks for yeah. having me, Marilyn. Absolutely. So you know, let's just kick this off. But actually, first, Jonathan, why don't you tell us a little bit about your brokerage? And if you want to go back to the Honduran days, that's interesting too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to go back to the origin days. I'll, I'll spare you that story. But um, uh, I started in the real estate industry in property management and rentals. So that's my bread and butter, and that has kind of stuck with me throughout my career. But uh, Location Real Estate, we're a full service real estate company, commercial, residential, rentals, sales, any which way you can you can dissect the real estate industry, we have our hand in it. Um, and we currently operate in six states, which gives me a very unique perspective um, on different parts of the country. We're in different regions, Florida, Georgia, Colorado, Alabama, Texas, and as of yesterday, South Carolina. So, Congratulations. Thank you very much. Exciting times and, and rentals are a big part of our business. Well, I love that you're expanding your business in this time when many other people are constricting. Tell us about that. Why are you continuing to expand right now? That's a great story. Well, there's anytime there's a market like what we are experiencing right now, uh, a, a, a changing market, right? Uh, there's two directions that you can go. There are those who become predators and there are those who become prey. Um, if you have set your business up to be uh, essentially look towards the future when you're expecting this downturn of a market, you can financially prepare your business to be ready for it and be in that specific category you want to be. You can choose to survive or you can choose to thrive. And we're expanding and looking to take advantage of opportunities of some companies that need help, technology side, financial side, all of the above, to expand our footprint and just make the family bigger. So be the predator or be the prey. I like being the predator, I think. <laughs> I, don't, I don't, That one doesn't sound great either, but I'd rather be that, of course, than the prey. Um, awesome. So. I love that you started with rentals because we're going to come back to that in a minute. But, you know, what are you doing? I mean, this market shifted kind of under our feet, right? It was all of a sudden, it, it, I mean, it seemed like it happened in days almost where it was like crazy, crazy, 75 offers on every house and into, whoa, like rakes, right? Those mortgage interest rates came up and the whole thing started to really slow down relatively quickly. But what have you done? How have you expanded down? You know, what have you done differently since we've seen that that market shift in just a few months ago? Well, it's it's really important not to get too busy with your day to day operations. And while everything's great and what we experienced in 2021, what everyone likely experienced in 2021, you step your foot outside the house and you had somebody who was ready to buy. Uh, <laughs> but when you're going through that, you have to constantly look at the future. And fortunately, we took the time to do so and prepared for, hey, this isn't going to last forever. So what's the next evolution? What is going to be important to realtors? when this isn't happening anymore. You know, it's famine instead of feast. Mm -hmm. And you can see the transactional volume decrease immensely this year. Some are still experiencing career years. However, the majority aren't. So a way that we created an opportunity to continue to have recurring revenue uh, for realtors without having to be dependent on sales transactions was really pushing more of the rental aspect in front of them as, mm -hmm. as that being an angle in which they can continue their relationships with their current consumers and continue to make money. So bringing in the angle of property management and enabling the agents to be at the forefront of customer relations with property management mm -hmm. gives them that rental angle, as well as maintaining that relationship for when they are ready to buy. So nobody wants to rent forever, right? The idea is you're a renter until you're a buyer. You're a buyer, then you're a seller, and you're referring people into the business the whole way through. So maintaining the relationships and not being so doom and gloom because there's always a way. Yeah, I, we were talking about it earlier. Jonathan is an independent, uh, independently owned brokerage, um, and even if you're not independently owned, one of the things I love about real estate is that we're scrappers, 
right? We will find a way. And like you say, there's always some opportunity. When one starts to fall off, there's another one that arises. We've seen it over and over and over. And so, um, Brian, you know, across the country, you work with brokerages everywhere. What what kinds of changes are you seeing? Are, are you seeing people shifting their focus? Uh, we are seeing that, Marilyn. We do. We have brokers and MLS partners all across the country. Uh, so we are seeing, we're seeing the shift. I mean, home sales are down, obviously, um, you know, and especially in that first time home buyer market, we're seeing that sales are really down, right? I was looking at the NAR stats uh, the other day and for September the under 100,000 price range um, is down almost 24%. The 100 to 250 is down o- over 28%, which just tells us one thing is that there's first time home buyers who wanted to be in the market and really had a lot of opportunities when rates were you know, in the threes and that range, they're mm-hmm. seeing some of their opportunities kind of float away right now as the rates increase. Um, these are people who wanna buy homes eventually, but for one reason or another, they either, you know, they probably lost a bidding war or 10 uh, right. over the last year or two. Um, and now, you know, with prices not coming down just yet, but rates being higher, as high as they've been in uh, since the since 2008, um, we're seeing a lot of people just kind of take a second and decide, all right, might not be the best time for me right now. What am I going to do? And we're finding that, you know, everybody has to live somewhere, right? And about it's like 36 percent of uh, people right now are renting uh, in the, in the U.S. So there is an opportunity there uh, for agents who have, in a lot of times, invested a lot of time working with these buyers. Um, you know, sometimes for 18 months or two years, mm-hmm. and they're just taking a break. But they have built these relationships, or they want to continue to build these relationships. So one of the best ways to do that um, is to help them find somewhere to live while they're still looking, right? So a lot of agents are focusing back on the renters. Um, I think the latest stat out there says the average first time home buyer is 36 years old, Mm -hmm. um, which means that, you know, realistically, someone's going to rent for 10 years before they buy something. And the real question is, how can you as an agent build a relationship with those people while they're still looking and before they buy so that when they do decide to buy or they can buy, you're the person that they look to as the trusted source, as the expert, because you know, you've helped them find one, two, sometimes three or four places to live before they actually buy something. Um, so we are seeing a lot of agents kind of uh, seeing, reading the tea leaves, if you will, and seeing that there, you know, there's going to be some opportunity in the future for people who can build those relationships now for the future. Yeah, it was interesting. Um, There's a story that I heard about uh, uh, an agent in Houston and uh, a a woman was coming in from out of town and was looking for a, you know, a pretty expensive, if you know the Houston, that sort of inner loop, you know, where those big high rises are, there's a lot of luxury condos and things. She was looking to rent in there. She reached out to about five agents and four of the agents ignored her because it was like, oh, poo poo, it's a rental. I don't care. And the one woman that worked with her ultimately got a $32 million sale out of it. And the, the, the owner of the property actually reached out to the other four agents in a very immature way with, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> right? if you would stick with me, this could have been your commission, but no, you guys were too smart. So Jonathan, uh, you know, there's, there's agents, and I'm sure you have some, especially if your business is growing as quickly as it sounds like it is, you know, that have only sold residential, frankly, may have only sold residential in these, what we're now probably going to call the yaya years, right? <laughs> Where it's like, you put a sign in the, in the, the door and away we go. How do you get them to shift? You know, how do you, how do you get people to shift that focus? Because of course the commission is lower than it would be in a house. How, how do you convince them that that's the right thing to do? It's a very challenging feat. Very, very challenging. I mean, when you've gone through, imagine somebody's been in the industry for 20 years, 25 years, and all they have ever known is residential sales, buyers and sellers. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to get that mindset shift. Mm -hmm. But with that being said, over the last 10 years, the function and compensation offerings through rentals have changed drastically. Mm -hmm. A lot of times and in many marketplaces, rentals are driven through specifically property management companies or owners marketing their own properties. But there are markets where that's not the case, and it's very commonplace for realtors to to work rentals. Mm-hmm. Yep. In fact, we we have many that only do rentals and they don't do sales, and then they look to break into sales after. Mm-hmm. But how do you get somebody to change back into it? It's really showing them the proof. And when you see every month we put out a top producers report, 
ours went out an hour ago for October, for example. And in our top producers report, there is one agent on the Southeast Florida uh, region market that only does rentals and was a top producer over all of these other people in the top five in our entire company. Wow. 3,200 people that made more money than the others strictly by doing rentals. So when you share that and you share that story within the network, mm -hmm. they see that and it's eye opening. So real stories of real actual business interactions is what will open somebody's eyes. And you guys here attending this today, you're getting that inside scoop. It is possible. It is great and recurring revenue even better with property management. Well, you know, we did some research on rentals uh, with, with consumers a few years ago, and it was really interesting. P people are very much interested in working with an agent. I think sometimes their perception is, well, I only work with an agent when I'm buying. But the truth is the rental process isn't always so fun either. There's a lot of a lot of things. And we'll talk a little bit about how Rent Spree helps that because I went through this myself with Rent Spree. Um, but, you know, um, it, it, it's just interesting to see that um, there's a lot of different ways to to slice the bologna, so as they say, right? Um, and it, it you can make money. But what I was going to say is that in the in the survey, what the people said was they really liked working with realtors because realtors, of course, know what they're talking about. And again, like you were saying, Brian, if they stick with me over and over and over, if I want to move or I want to upgrade or now I'm having a child and I wanted to buy a house, but I don't have the, you know, I just can't do it right now. I need a bigger place, all of that stuff. If you move someone one, two, three times, even just that one time, you have a relationship with them that's a lot better than someone that's just coming in cold. So if you stick with them, when this market eventually turns to a place where they feel like they can't afford, you're going to be their agent of choice. It, it's a long-term play, right? But but it's, what you're saying is it's a short-term and a long-term play, right, Jonathan? You can make money now and you can see a huge sphere for yourself down the road once you know the market starts to turn. But so, you know, one of the things that's, um, we were just helping a friend of ours rent a property in Los Angeles. And um, he was applying to a lot of them because like everyone, like even rentals are hard to get these days, right? Um, and he used rent spree and it was so much easier because once he applied, he applied and put all the information into the tenant screen and process with rent spree, then you just basically hit go and it does it again and again and again and again. It saved him so much time. And he didn't know anything about real estate, right? He's just, he's an entrepreneur that happened to need to rent something. Um, so tell us a little bit, Brian, about how, you know, how do you see people using it in just practical ways to make this shift, either the shift or the focus on rentals? How does it make their lives easier? Well, to your point, Marilyn, uh, just having the online application makes life a lot easier, right? A lot of rental uh, processes are very antiquated uh, yep. because they are, you know, the forgotten, sometimes the forgotten part of real estate. So yep. everybody focuses on making the buying and the selling process a lot easier. Um, so when you're collecting paper applications and sometimes faxing uh, half completed handwritten applications in, and then you've got to run somebody down to collect an application fee, all of that adds to... Uh, I think the misconception that, well, rentals aren't worth the time right. because if you're, if you are working that way, they might not be worth the time, right? If you're working in a very inefficient manner, mm -hmm. then it might not make sense. Right. But if you can, you know, get that down to, Hey, here's a link, fill this out, pay the fee and we'll review your application. You just went from, you know, what could be an hour or two of work to what could be a minute or two of work. And then the math starts to change, you know, on the, it's not worth my time. Right. If you have a, to, you know, if you're going to make $2,000 on a rental and you work for five hours, that's $400 an hour, right? You're an attorney at that point uh, when it really comes down to it. Right. Uh, you know, now if you're going to work a hundred hours, you know, even $20 an hour, it's not that bad, but I can see where the math comes in. Right. But when you can make it simple for the agent and also have the consumer have a, a nice experience too, right? They don't want to fill out a hundred different applications. They don't want to pay a hundred different application fees to find a place, right? So if you can say, hey, here's a universal application, fill this out. And then if you want to apply again, it's as simple as click a button and you can apply for another property. Or at the very least, here's a report that you can print out and you've got a nice packaged application and all of your reports and you're ready to go. So that can really help agents save a lot of time uh, when it comes to working with rentals. Yeah, I, I think their perception might be, you know, we have transaction management and all kinds of things on the residential side. There may not be as much awareness that, in effect, 
it's not transaction management, but it's kind of like that. It's application management, which is kind of like submitting an offer, right? It's not, it's not that different. So Jonathan, in your business, you know, once you convince those, um, the smart ones right, to take the move over and start to focus on rentals again, how do you use, you know, what tools do you use to help manage it? How does it rent spree, if it fits in, how does, how does all that work in your business? How do you make it easier for them to make that shift? No, no problem. Uh, rent spree is a major part of the rental processing for location agents. Okay. Um, when you start marketing a vacancy, for example, yes, there are some of our markets where rentals go onto the MLS. There are yep. some markets where they don't. Uh, and when they don't, rent spree is a great place to start for marketing. Um, you get it in there and you can utilize that as kind of your hub to send out all of your marketing pieces, all of your, your initial listings on the different internet sites. Rent spree is kind of your hub on how you market the vacant listing when your MLS is not really conducive to do so. Okay. And it's very, very simple to obtain the applications. The old days of getting an application dropped off, as you guys mentioned before, Brian mentioned the online application is incredibly life-changing for your business. Mm -hmm. And you can list, for example, that first property on Rentspree, utilize it for the marketing, but it's also giving you that third-party link that sits inside of Rentspree where it goes on your listing, it goes on your marketing pieces, it goes into a flyer inside the vacant unit. And anyone who wishes to apply, it all comes into a centralized space where the agent can be the conduit between mm -hmm. applicants and landlord for selecting the proper tenant. After that, you then have the lease drafting, you then have monies, deposits, all of that stuff, which can be done within the rent free platform, but can also be done outside. So it's allowed to kind of, I hate to say it this way, but pick your poison, uh, utilize which tool within your arsenal that you wish to make it most efficient for you. Mm -hmm. uh, I have found that rent free linking through to our transaction management makes it just really seamless for an agent. Mm -hmm. um, and a really nice, easy experience. I've got a, a duo of two that do over 20 rentals every single month. Um, they right. wouldn't be able to do that without a system like Rentspree. And so the, talk about that too. So you have, would you kind of call this sort of the front end of the process? And then you have a a process like a property management tool that this connects to so you can well, manage yeah, it there's time. a few there's a few different angles so if okay. the agent doesn't do property management if they're not enrolled with property management with us uh they use rent spree as the front end and qualification and then take that into the transaction management for the formal agreements which ties into the office so there's nothing additional to do it's actually easier than a sale and what so many fail to realize is okay i may not make the money today that i would make on a sale but you never know where that deal's coming from. You mentioned that story in Houston with the $32 million deal. The right. biggest referral I ever got was off of a $750 rental. Um, one guy worked in a marina, treated him like anyone else when no one else would give him the time of day. And he referred me yacht owner after yacht owner after yacht owner. Nice. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. Um, anyhow, <laughs> uh, but that's the process. If you can make it efficient and loop these people into your CRM and your nurturing campaigns, which I hope you have set up, uh, the age old joke, what's the best CRM? The one you use, right? <laughs> so if you can get them in there and set up a nurturing plan, you're going to stay in front of these people and you can make this efficient and almost contactless uh, throughout the process until they're ready for that next stage that you're constantly keeping in front of them. So in the CRM, do you have sort of rent a rental funnel as well as a residential sales funnel? Do you keep them separate? Yeah, we created tags for uh, tenant prospects, converted tenants, landlord prospects, converted landlords. And they each have different campaigns that are tied to them. Tenant side, obviously, to convert into buyers or if they didn't rent a place, a rent to own option. And on the landlord side about acquiring different, uh, different investment properties or property management services themselves. So there, there's angles at every point that you see in the real estate industry for you to get. And just to piggyback on that, John, you know, yeah. we see somewhere around three to five applications per property, which means that there's somewhere between two and four people who didn't get that property. They right. may or may not be working with an agent, but there's another opportunity right there. Uh, and they're just kind of landing in your lap. And as part of the, you know, one of the application questions we have is, are you working with an agent? So it's very easy for awesome. you or your agents to figure out whether they are working with someone or not. And plus, we know, you know, if you're working with renters, you're going to know when that lease is up, right? When you have a buyer who buys something and they're going to sell, you're kind of just doing the math like, oh, every five to seven years, who knows what will happen. But with renters, you know when they're leaving or when they might be leaving. So it's very easy 
to set up campaigns to check in with them to say, all right, it's been six months. How are you feeling right now? You thinking about staying? You thinking about finding a new place? What about buying? If you're thinking about buying, I can introduce you to a lender who can help you get pre-qualified and then move them to that next stage. So I think you have a little bit more information about your prospects when they're renters, as opposed to uh, buyers who bought something and then you're just trying to tie up, did they have a child recently or, you know, did, right. you know, did they get a new job on LinkedIn or something like that? Or, you know, would they be moving? You're just kind of guessing. But rentals allow you to just say, I know that lease started on November 1st, but it was a 12 month lease. So I better start checking in a few months ahead of time to see what they're going to do. That's a really good point. I love the idea of built-in leads. That's in effect what it is, right? If I yeah. get one of them works with me, but there's five others that don't and two or three of those don't have a realtor, then away you go. You just, not only did you were you able to rent this one, but you got leads for renting something else. So, and Jonathan, I'm, I'm fascinated to find out what you do to nurture the, the, um, the property owner side of this, right? I mean, you hear lots of stories these days about, you know, people starting to change regulations on what you can rent and, you know, the, your guest house that you couldn't rent before you now can, or you can put a, a single dwelling unit in the backyard. And, you know, do you, do you see that type of opportunity? So people that already know homeowners could potentially take advantage of this too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's different aspects. So you want to try and hit them for what is going to be applicable to that individual homeowner. Mm -hmm. So you want to categorize them even more than just the general four that I gave you. Uh, right. There's obviously a lot of subcategories, but it, when you're going after a landlord that has been converted, you have the relationship with them. And if you don't do property management, you are not touching that person for a minimum of nine to 12 months until they need a renewal or a new lease drafted or something along those lines. So you want right. to stay in front of them with market relative information. Mm -hmm. uh, there are apps out there, for example, like a, like a home bot, you don't own, you didn't sell them the property perhaps. Right. But you rented it out and you can still keep in front of them for market values. One of the biggest issues I see with agents is they complete a type of transaction. Let's say it's a sale going back to that. Let's say it's a sale transaction. The consumer on both ends of that don't know that you do rentals and leasing at the same time. The and it goes the other way. If you helped a renter find a place, oh, I thought you only did rentals and you're losing the ability to capture that person. If you're not staying in front of them with your variety of services. So while it, without being salesy, offering something of value to stay in front of them, keeps them looking at it and keeps them engaged with you. So and not to have you give away trade secrets because we don't want you to do that, but you know, what, what percentage of your, like, like, you, you know, let's, let's just use the numbers that, that Brian said. So let's say your business falls off 24%, just as a round number, right? So let's say 25 for easy math. Do you envision being able to make that up? or even above that and beyond that? Like how, how much does the rental business you're focusing on and the property management business you're focusing on offset the potential downsides of what you've seen relative to last year? That's a great, a great question. And I can give you some, some analytics based on that because I have been doing this recently. Mm -hmm. um, we watch every single week and then month over month exactly what the trends are, balances between sales versus rentals, tenant side versus landlord side, et cetera, and see where the marketing efforts are really benefiting. Uh, mm -hmm. We've seen from 2021 where rentals were 20% of our business mm -hmm. to now where it's pushing 50. Um, wow. There is so much more of a rental market nationwide, even in areas that didn't do them before. You have right. inquiring minds asking that question of, hey, how do I break into that when it's not customarily there? So it is an interesting shift that we're seeing right now. Um, so how does that attribute uh, revenue wise? I mean, the numbers are definitely smaller on rentals. That's right. However, you're, you're able to establish that ability to earn revenue for individual agents on a wider platform. Mm -hmm. So think of instead of making the majority with companies on a split, for example, uh, let's say you make the majority of your money from your top 10% in production. Right. With rentals, you're, in, you're bringing in more people that can do more transactions at lower quantities. So it's taking that earnings and spreading it out from that top 10% across maybe 80% of your roster. That's so amazing. You should make about the same. However, it's just coming from a different angle or a different direction. But it's got to be better for retention if you're getting 80% of your people to get something going on, right? I mean, you're, you're keeping it the thing in effect, right? Yeah. I mean, whenever you're in a market like it, we're in right now, mm -hmm. um, agents start the freak out, right? They're right. not looking forward. Um, so 
an agent needs to think of, okay, how can I pivot? And I hate seeing when agents jump companies when they come to us or when they leave us either way, because the grass isn't greener. You got to look in the mirror before you change the aspect that's around you. <laughs> yeah. You need to change what you are doing. Changing the name on your card isn't going to do it. That's a good point. <laughs> so you, that's a whole, we could have a whole webinar just about that topic. <laughs> What what do you do to get those people that are freaking out? How do you get them to calm down to go, all right, guys, it's okay. Like we're, you know, you're not getting 45 offers anymore, but I got something else for you. Like, how, how do you get that shift? How do you get them to not like calm them down enough to get them to go over there? That's a, it's a great engagement, point. engagement now more than ever. Mm -hmm. It's important that we as brokers have relationships with our agents mm -hmm. and, and advice for agents. Don't sit on the sidelines and wait for somebody to come save your business. You need to analyze that and do it for yourself and reach out for support that is there for you. I don't know a broker in, in the industry that would ignore you when you're asking for help, especially in this kind of circumstances. They have some type of anecdote. They have some type of solution for you on an angle that you can go off of. And you have to see this in any market when a market changes and is going up and it's hot. Yeah, you need to change what you're doing there as well. So mm -hmm. there is always pivot. You can't be static. If you're not changing, you're dying. Exactly. So Brian, you know, for MLSs, there's a lot of MLSs that are empathetic to their subscribers and participants that are saying, what can we do to help? We know that they're seeing less inventory getting entered, less listings getting set up, et cetera, et cetera. How can an MLS somehow play or support brokers like Jonathan that are trying to make that pivot? Sure. Um, well, you know, there are obviously some MLSs that uh, do have rentals and focus on, I won't say focus on rentals, but have rentals with, we'll say, varying degrees of rules. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we're not getting uh, 8.0 level commitment uh, for rentals right now. But And then there are some MLSs that just don't do rentals at all. Um, so there is an opportunity for MLSs who have, you know, in the past, not really considered that as something that they want to focus on. Uh, they might think that they're, it's buying and selling is their primary uh, purpose. But at the end of the day, a consumer is a consumer, right? Uh, a, a landlord, whether they're selling or renting, they still need help. And tenants and buyers at the same level still need help, right? So there is an opportunity there. There is a market that exists that um, they can either uh, start uh, working with or actually maybe shift a little bit more focus towards that, right? I think we lost 20 per 30% of realtors uh, between 08 and 2012 when it finally bottomed out. Um, yep. If the numbers keep up in the same level right now, that would be, you know, we lose almost 500,000 realtors in the next three years. Um, because, you know, if you don't have anything to do and that bill, when the bill comes in, it's a, it's a consideration, right? You know, you know, you, your, your mortgage comes every month or your rent comes every month, whether you sell a house or don't sell a house, right? So, you know, as much as everybody wants to sell the million dollar houses, they really just want to get paid sometimes, right? So, if you can give them an option to say, hey, I know you, you know, I, I know you want to go sell a million dollars a month over here, but if you do a couple rentals, you'll make three, four, five thousand dollars, you'll meet a bunch of clients for the future, and you start building that roadmap, but you're also gonna get paid, right? Um, yeah. because they may find that it's, you know, there are people that will always have to move, whether they, you know, whether by force or just be, you know, new job, they're moving somewhere else. Um, some, you know, life happens. So people will always have to move. And that market will be there. I think uh, they're predicting, Freddie Mac's predicting 5.1 million sales uh, next year. Uh, there were 6.9 million sales in 2001. So we're going to lose almost 2 million sales in two years, right? How do you help your agents, you know, find a piece of the pie that doesn't exist anymore, right? Or that may, they may not have considered in the past. So right. whether you're a broker, you're an agent, or you're an MLS, I think it's the same question, and I think it all applies across all of those verticals, obviously at varying you know, magnitudes, if you will, but it's still the same question, and it's still an option for everyone. I, I hate to say it this way, but we have to go back to the basics of how we initially worked in the beginning of, of our careers. And I mean, mine is rentals, so that's it's easy for me, but when a new agent comes into the marketplace, and they, they typically don't have the funding from their prior career to go in and throw $5,000 a month into lead generation activities, right? They have to come in and leverage some sweat equity and invest some time into growing their network and growing their business. And there is not a better place to start than with rentals. 
Absolutely not. You're creating a database of people that so many agents turn away and they want to work with you. They want your help. And you're creating a lifelong fans of your business by treating them a certain way, giving them that purchase experience on a rental property. They're thinking it was just a rental, but in your eyes, it's something incredibly important. It is the roof over their family's head. It is where they live and they sleep every single day. It is impactful if you if you handle it the right way. That's that's a really important psychological point. You can never project it's just a rental. And going back to the MLS side of things, I think some of them do that. You know, the fact that some don't allow any rentals to me, I'm speaking as Marilyn, not as you guys, I think that's crazy. I don't know why, because if your job is to be the curator of data that enables business, why would you not curate rental data? It enables business. And especially in a time like this where it's different. So Jonathan, and feel free to, um, you don't have to name names, but you, you've got to work with a bunch of MLSs if, and if you're in six states, right? Is it frustrating to you for those that just refuse to, to play on the rental side relative to those that do? Well, our, our primary market is Florida and even Florida in a state in itself is so segmented. Uh, mm -hmm. Southeast Florida, for example, it is a hub for rentals. I mean, that is by far and above the biggest marketplace we see for rentals and the rental rates obviously uh, support that. But mm -hmm. it's frustrating in other areas, uh, especially of high population like Denver, Austin, Houston, uh, places like that, where it's really not even secondary, it's more tertiary to the market, mm -hmm. where rentals aren't even talked about between agents. Rentals aren't talked about with brokerages, and there's no data in the MLS for it. You're you're encountering a market right now where, as Brian, as Brian alluded to, agents are determining whether they even want to renew their MLS subscription. So this is a time right. where MLSs should be fighting for more data, more content, more reasons that their member would want to stay with them. And that's bringing in the ability to earn income on rentals. Uh, they just need to be more open. It's frustrating with how people are, typically MLSs are, are resistant to change and evolution. And it's hard to make things different than how it's always been. But we need to open our eyes to that. And those of our attendees that are involved with their association and their MLSs, you need to bring up that conversation because you're not the only one in the room thinking it, but you might be the only one who's willing to say it. That, that's exactly right. I, I totally agree with you. I mean, if you're an MLS and this is just in general and you're dealing with people that have nimble business operations and I would, that's how I would call brokerages, right? You're changing on a dime. Why? Because you have to. <laughs> you don't love it either, but you have to. If you're not changing on a dime with them, you're not supporting them. It's that simple. So, you know, and not to get too detailed, Brian, but, you know, if if an MLS, and I know you work with a lot of them, we've worked with some of our clients, you work with them. How can an MLS support their brokers if they use rent free? What is it going to get them? Not not all the details, but just, you know, kind of an overview. What what does it enable and how sure. does the brokers do business in rentals? Yeah, when we work with our MLS partners, um, we really kind of automate the entire process. We get right into the listing entry form. It's as in most cases, it's as simple as, do you want the rents free apply link? Yes or no. They click the button, the link is created, it's inserted into the MLS, the agent is emailed, they have all the details. So literally it is clicking a button. And uh, we did a survey recently with an, ML, an, an unnamed MLS partner. We just did a quick analysis on all of their rentals. And we're finding that rents free rentals in this MLS are going, the ones that use the apply link are going off the market six days faster than the ones that don't. Wow. Right. And that ends up being it's like a 20% faster, right, than ones that aren't. And again, when it comes down to your time, your effort, six days less, you know, the less the less days on market, obviously, the closer you're going to get to asking price. Um, and the less work you will have to do in order to do that. So, you know, we're finding that being able to provide that to their members, you know, for them, it's a it's a service, it's an additional service that they don't have to um you know, that they can just offer to their, to their members and they get to use the tool and every, you know, I shouldn't say everybody in general, people who use it once, um, they tend to have an enjoyable experience and they tend to, it helps them realize, okay, rentals aren't that bad. Right. Because I thought this was going to be 40 hours of work, but it ended up being 10, right. That's a much different conversation than, oh, I don't want to have to run around and collect checks or, you know, I can't read this half completed application and now I got to send it back and I can't get in touch with these people. 
having everything in one spot where you can, you know, you can email the application to a potential tenant. You know whether they started it, whether they uh, started it all, whether they started it and they haven't finished it. Just being able to see those things allows agents to make decisions, right? Because if I'm a, oh, this renter wants to apply. Well, I sent him the link three days ago and it looks like he never even opened it. So he's probably not that serious. Let's right. move on, right? Or, you know, we've gotten five applications in. Let's make a decision, right? So you can just move through those rentals a lot faster when you can put everything in one place and have it automated and, you know, digitized all right there. Well, going back to that six days, six days faster, that means I can pay my mortgage six days faster, right? I mean, let's talk exactly. about practicality, right? It's, we're faster to money that way. That's what it really comes down to, which is awesome. So, you know, and the flip side of this, um, again, I keep coming back to those property owners, right? You know that there's realtors that have people that might have been thinking about selling their rental property or might have been, you know, might have thought about other things and stopped for all the same reasons that other people are stopping, right? Does it help them, do you think, deepen their relationships? Like, can, does that whole landlord thing open up another another way to deepen their relationships with some of their clients? Um, for sure. May, may I answer that one? Yeah, go for uh, it. Yeah. Okay. So absolutely. It's a different angle. Um, it, it's a stronger connection when you're doing property management and interacting with that landlord and being entrusted with their money month in and month out. Uh, but regardless, at the end of a rental period, a landlord, even if you're not managing it, is it's a touch point. There right. are certain markets where realtors write up lease renewals. They, they write up the following year. That's an income process right there. Mm -hmm. But in addition, it's, okay, what's your plan going forward with this? Are you intending to keep it? Are you intending to sell it? In the market we're in right now, more often than not, we're keeping it. Right. So it's more about just maintaining that connection and that relationship. Anytime, regardless of the type of consumer, if you stop your point of communication or you stop your interaction or you refer them to an outside property management company, every one of those is an opportunity for you to lose that relationship. It is absolutely imperative that you are involved, not every step of the way, but periodically along the way, so you stay top of mind. The consumer is not worried about working with you and offending you the next time they do a transaction. They're thinking, I need to accomplish X. Who, who can help me do that? That's going to be Y person. X plus Y equals closed transaction. Meanwhile, you're floating around somewhere in outer space. So it's important to keep that connection. And the landlord side is lease renewals. It's staying in touch, everything good with the tenant, things along those lines, and actually caring about the type of tenant you put in the property. If it goes poorly, your relationship will go poorly. If it goes well, everything's good. Well, and lease renewals, we like those things that come up once a year. You sell a house, it could be, you might never talk to that person again, right? You, you right. might be making money year after year after year on this thing. Now, let's talk a little bit about investors. I, I, I'm guessing, Jonathan, you have a suite of investors you work with, but you know, people that are buying and selling lots of houses, whether it's an institutional investor or even someone that's buying, you know, five, 10, 15 houses, does this process help you with that as well? Uh, rents free does, but it's more on the property management side of things where it comes into play. Okay. Uh, when you're acquiring the, the unit itself. Yeah. Great. Um, it's nice to be able to go through all of that, but that's the purchase. Right. Uh, when you go to market those vacant units or you go to qualify applicants and tenants that are going into those units and maintaining them going forward. Rents free gives you the complete profile. Every little bit that you're going to want to know, you can get through the rents free application process. And it's all in one centralized place, approve, deny, bring that information forward in a consolidated tenant information piece to then either hand to the landlord, hand to the property manager, or bring into your own property management software and keep it going forward. Um, it, it really just streamlines everything. It's honestly, I don't think that our agents would be as efficient as they are now with rentals without the partnership with Rent Screen. Uh -oh, did we lose Marilyn? Uh, we may have, but back to what you were saying earlier, Jonathan, about, you know, if you work with a buyer or seller, they might not think you work with renters or you work with a uh, tenant or a landlord. They might not think you work with buyers and sellers. So this is a great way to just kind of, you know, layer it in multiple levels, right? I helped you buy this. Now I'm going to help you, you know, I can help you rent it as well. So it lets them know that you cover all aspects of the transaction. And yeah, the more that you can get that message out, obviously, the more opportunities uh, you're going to have um, when it comes to, hey, you know, investors tend to know investors, right? So 
if they know other investors, hey, you should definitely call Jonathan. Jonathan's got this process. He made it super easy for me to handle this, to handle everything. And that's why I work with him. And then he may say, oh, my buddy's going to 100%. And that's, I think that's the key is that rentals can lead to so many referrals, whether it's other tenants, other landlords, buyers, sellers. Uh, David Howell from McInerney and Associates has a great story about um, an agent of his who helped uh, there in DC, helped a secret service agent rent a house, right? He made like $400 on it, probably lost money in the long run. 45 deals over the coming years, just from that, from referrals from that rental. So if you are thinking of rentals as like, this little bit isn't worth it for me, you really need to take a step back and look at the long tail view to figure out what the possibilities could be when it comes down to it. And I think, you know, everyone has a story or two. You've got one, Jonathan, you got one, Marilyn's got one, you know, uh, I have a bunch as well, but it's, and I, I think people just kind of need to be reminded of that every once in a while, that it's not just about that one rental. It's about what else getting into their sphere. Once you get into someone's sphere, you know, who knows what happens in a deal, on a deal from a deal perspective. You, you reminded me of, something I used to teach agents. This was before we had this hot market, um, of the item that known as COVID. Um, prior to that, it, it was a lot about lead generation and exactly what you were, you were mentioning right there of infiltrating a certain network or group of referrals. Um, this is a great time to go back to that. And I, I have coached agents on going into a specific organization or a school or a corporation, something going in and creating in, in cooperation with leadership there an employee benefits group or employee benefit package, which is some type of rebate or streamlined process because they're an employee there. And you're getting not only one employee referring another employee, but you're getting it from the top down. You're getting leaders that are saying, we are investing in your home. The more local you are, the longer term employee they're gonna be. So it benefits that company, but your name just gets passed around continuously. If you make that streamlined experience through something like a rents free, on the sales side and a different platform, but uh, the idea is infiltrating and creating this network effect where all roads lead back to you. So I, I throw it back to the audience. Does anyone, anybody have any questions for Jonathan or for Brian or myself? Or uh, if you have any uh, success stories like what we were just talking about, I'd love to hear yours as well. I'm sure there's people on the call that have um, have had one of those luck, like the, the, the secret service agent type thing, but I'd love to hear from, if there's anybody here that wants to share any of those ideas with us, um, or if you have any questions about rent spree or about rentals, if you're an MLS, um, I, I don't know how, Brian, how would they reach out? Is it just Brian at rentspree.com if they had any uh, Yeah, Brian P at rentspree.com. I, I can introduce you to uh, to Bill and Lauren from our MLS team, um, and they'd be happy to, to meet with you and just go a little bit more in depth. That sounds Brian, great. Can you, uh, can you connect me with somebody there? I'd love to introduce them to our MLS and get more more integrations than uh, than the relationship that are already there with my primary. I certainly can. It's it's, it's a, it, it just makes sense. I mean, MLSs have to keep moving and it, it they just have to keep moving because brokers are keeping to, you know, they're keep moving. If you want to exactly. stay with your customers, you just got to, you got to go where they go. Uh, the fact that some people still don't have any, again, still makes me mad. <laughs> it's like, well, it's you, business. You talk, about, you talk about the ability to pivot and evolve with market conditions based on what members need and don't need. And right. we talked about this a little bit the other day. It's going to be a little bit more uh, directed towards the MLSs here. But if you are not incorporating MLS data with rentals, you are missing an opportunity for your members. But yep. in addition, you're creating a void. And that void will be filled by someone else at some point. So you need to evolve. You need to incorporate that because it's what your members need. Or somebody else will come in and give it to them and you won't be there. And some of the people that are filling the voids are the people that MLSs absolutely do not really want to fill those voids. <laughs> we won't name names, but we all know who I'm talking about. So there's a few of them these days that are uh, not comfortable. So uh, any other comments? Any uh, any other? Oh, here we go. Here's a question for you. Um, how can you be sure that your uh, applications will be accepted by a property manager? So no uh, but data in it, I guess. Yeah. Good yep. question. That's a great question. Um, you know, we try to make our application as universal as possible. Um, you know, we've obviously uh, reviewed a number of different applications from different states to make sure that we're hitting all the highlights. I mean, you can never uh, guarantee that a property manager is going to take your report, but the reports are from TransUnion, which is one of the three major credit bureaus. 
Okay. Um, it's the full credit report. It's not a score. It's not an estimate. It's not a yes or no. It's the TransUnion resident score, uh, which just uh, is reflective of their um, past history paying things like their mortgages and rent and things like that. So um, we, can't, we can't guarantee it, but it will meet all the requirements that a property manager would need uh, in order to consider that tenant. So uh, can I take you back on top of that for a second? Yeah, go ahead, John. Absolutely. So what we saw about 10 years ago was uh, so many listing agents and property managers wanted you to go through their platform. And if you're talking to the institutional investors, like an invitation home, something like that, there's really no way around it. But when you're dealing with an individual property owner, um, in my experience, we've seen a whole lot more be accepted through rent free, especially over the last year or two, as mm -hmm. rent free has carried more of an industry known name that you're not going through tenantscreening.com, you know, something that they've never heard. It sounds like you just Googled it. Uh, rent free is well known. It's credible. And uh, it's been accepted much more across the board, even when they have their own application process. So Susan also said property managers like to charge their own fees for application. What is the fee for yep. rent free? So rent free is $38 per applicant. Um, and that is traditionally paid for by the tenant. Um, there is an option when they're creating their apply link to choose who will pay it, whether it's uh, the, the uh, agent themselves or the landlord or the applicant. But I would say you know, 99% of the time, it's going to be the applicant uh, that pays that fee. And $38 is one of the uh, lowest fees uh, that's charged out there right now. I, you know, Sometimes we see $50, $75, dollars $100. And that's another problem, right, is when if, you know, if you have to apply to two or three or four before you find that and you're paying $50 or more per time, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, you know, you're start you're, you're, you're in hundreds of dollars with these fees and our reports are good for 30 days. You can re, you can use them as many times as you want in those 30 days. So, you know, at least you have given your tenant the opportunity to have an application good for 30 days that has all the information that they would need to apply. Um, and then it would, it, you know, with some property matters, they may want you to run through their own process. Um, but if they, I think if they looked at the report to Jonathan's, we're up the point, we're up to 45 uh, MLSs. We've got uh, three major brands that we're partnered with. Uh, and we're with, you know, 150 plus brokers throughout the country. So our name is really just, uh, as more and more people are hearing about us, more and more people are saying, oh, okay, that's the rent free application. Uh, I, you know, I know that they're a legitimate company uh, and, and I'm happy to take a look at that. Well, and just to clarify that $38 is for all the applications, right? If, if I yep. go through you and I, and I apply for 10 houses, 10 apartments, it's one time. Yep. Where as long as you do it in that 30 day window, you can yeah, keep applying. Systems, it's could be two, three, $400. Um, there's a question. Isn't there a cap on what landlords can charge for the application fees? Are, are there laws about that? In some locations, there are. For, for instance, we'll use New York as probably the most well-known example. New York State limits the fee to $20. Um, we've, uh, we work, we've worked to make sure that, you know, if you apply, if you have an, you create an application link for a property in New York, um, we know that if the state is New York, only charge $20. They also don't allow you to use eviction reports as a reason to deny a tenant a property. So if the property is in New York, we don't return the eviction report, right? So that helps protect your agent's from themselves at some level, because sure. if your landlord or your agent isn't aware of that, mm -hmm. then they may be out there saying, oh, you know, you were evicted three years ago, you can't have our house. Well, that you're not allowed to do that. So we can kind of help protect the brokers and the agents um, who might not work with rentals all the time and might not be up to date on all the latest rules um, from themselves. Those and, change frequently. And, and you know, yep. Jonathan, like he and like many, there's they have property management systems. Does Rentspree integrate with those back end systems for for brokers? Uh, we don't right now. Uh, we are expanding our tool sets. You know, we've recently lost the uh, launched single property listing pages. Um, we have a rent pay. Uh, we'll in a week or two, we'll be rolling out um, a single time payments through the platform as well. Um, so we are our goal is to expand our suite to be able to cover all of that. Um, and, you know, the roadmap is there, it's on the roadmap. Um, but for right now, you know, I think where we really help fill a void is uh, the difference between a lease listing agent and a property manager, right? There are certain things you can do as a lease listing agent that you're not allowed to do as a property manager. We cover everything that a lease listing agent is allowed to do from marketing to collecting applications to sharing them with the landlord. Um, all of those things are typically uh, allowed uh, under lease listing contracts. Uh, and we help with all of those things. 
Uh, is there a monthly fee for rent, rent spree or is it a per rental? There is no fee for rent spree. Uh, we are a free platform. Um, so everyone is welcome to create an account. If you go to rentspree.com, um, you can sign up today. It takes about a minute to do that. Name and an email address, pick a password, and you're ready to go. Uh, for brokers uh, and MLSs that want to form partnerships, um, we're happy to talk about that. There's some additional things we can do. Uh, a lot of uh, some integrations um, that can kind of automate the process and make it easier at the brand or brokerage or MLS level. And can an agent use Rentspree if they're not in one of the 45 markets that MLSs have signed up? Absolutely. Rentspree.com, name, email address, you're ready to go. Um, it's just a more manual process. You'll have to, you know, you'll have to hand enter the property details. If you want to use the listing pages, you have to upload your own photos and those kinds of things. Um, but with partnerships, really easy, though. I mean, the manual oh, entry, yeah. that you, you hear manual entry and you think daunting, and it's not. I remember using Rentspree before you had all these integrations. And it, it had already sold me then. So it's only gotten better and better. So manual yeah. is the problem. So we try to keep it as simple as possible. It's yeah. like the address. And then I think it's seven fields uh, that it's all. And it's, you know, type of property, beds, baths, everything you would need to know in, in order to uh, want to, you know, collect applications on the property. So uh, to Jonathan's point, you can create a, you can create the link in two minutes or less. Awesome. Well, I, Jonathan, I'm going to bring I'm going to throw it back to you for the final final. You can bring us home here. You know, what's your advice? If you're a broker, you're like, uh oh, I don't know what to do, or, or I've dabbled in, in rentals. I haven't gotten serious. I got agents that are fighting me. Like, what's your advice about how to make this? You know, what you're doing, making it up to fifty percent of their of your transactions. The best advice I can give is change the messaging that you have with your agents and reach out to those who are struggling, reach out to those who are not transacting. As brokers, we can be so focused on those that are generating the revenue or generating the sales uh, to bring money into the company. Uh, you need to focus on those that are not, and those are the ones who are truly going to benefit. Number one, appreciate your, your outreach. Number two, create more loyal agents that stick with your company and don't jump ship because the grass looks greener. Um, and you're going to have more of an impact on your bottom line. Those that are transacting and still making money in this changed, uh, changed market are still going to make money. Focus on those that are not. You will increase your bottom line revenue and you'll increase the culture and fans or number of fans that you have of your business bringing in more agents because of that support because of that outreach. Set up systems and partnerships like with Rentspree, set up processes and procedures and teach classes about how to market rentals, how to monetize them and how to follow up with your people to keep the relationship with them and convert them into a rent to own, a straight purchase, all of these types of programs. But I'll tell you the most important one, bless you. The yeah. most important one is working with a lender partner on creative programs that help coach and get renters converting into buyers. That's how your agents will buy into the process. They'll be Smart. apprehensive to going into rentals without an exit strategy to take them back. So creating a pathway for not only the consumer, but the agent to bring those people back into what their ultimate goal is. And until they do a rental and make money on it, can you really change their mind? Super Great smart, point, Jonathan. So we got one final question from Jerry. Does does Rentspree advertise listings online? And if so, what's the URL? Uh, so we are not uh, syndicating at this point, but every uh, listing has the ability to create its own uh, single property web page. Uh, so um, each of the uh, URLs is unique, but you can upload, I think it's 50 photos. It has the apply link embedded in there. It has a contact agent button. All of those leads go directly to the agent. Uh, and there's social media shares. So you can share Facebook, LinkedIn, and awesome. Twitter. Uh, click of a button. Uh, so, and then again, every lead that they get will come, you know, whether it's an application or just a question, all of those leads go directly to the, uh, to the, the lease listing agent. So the, your listing, your lead is back. I like That's it. That's right. All right. Well, you do the work, you get the, you get the benefits, right? Exactly. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, guys. This has been super interesting. And Jonathan, um, congratulations on that successful pivot and that amount of great success that you're having. I love the fact that you're engaging 80% of your agents because usually it's the other way, right? It, you know, 20% do 80% of the work, 80% do 20% of the work in this case. That's that's a much better model ultimately and usually more profitable for the brokerage. So that's awesome. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, if anybody needs more information, again, it's Brian P at rentspree.com. 
correct? Yep, that's it. B R I N P at Redmond. That's correct. All right. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you, Jonathan. Appreciate everybody's time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks. Thank you.